The following program was provided by an independent producer solely responsible for its content. The opinions expressed do not necessarily represent the views of this station, its staff, board of directors, or underwriters. Well, welcome to Chick Chatting. I'm Karen Testerman, your host, and today I am honored to have Michael King from the Massachusetts Family Institute, who is the communications director. What? No, it's not communications. It's uh, community alliances. Community mm -hmm. alliances. Mm -hmm. Okay, yep. that C word that got me mm -hmm. going there. And uh, we are going to have a conversation about the lobby days that Mass Family Institute mm -hmm. has, as well as parent forums. So welcome to Chick Chatting. It's good to be here. Nice to have you. Mm. So tell me, uh, what are the uh, parent forums that you yeah. are having with the Mass Family Institute? Yeah, so we're trying to really be a resource to parents all across the state of Massachusetts, especially when it comes to learning what's going on in their sex education classes, mostly in middle school and high school, mm -hmm. uh, but you know, also in the elementary schools, also in preschool. Um, we just find a lot of parents really don't know what's being taught um, in those classes. You know, a lot of times we find students don't want to talk to parents about what's in those classes. Um, many times the school is stonewalling parents if they want to know what's going on in those classes. Um, so, you know, as a resource, um, we've put together a plan where we actually do a public records request by law that they have 10 days to respond to us once we make that request, kind of like a FOIA. Mm -hmm. um, and we've been able to access a lot of these um, sex ed curricula that, you know, many parents have gone to one, two times, you know, to the, to the school officials and said, hey, can you uh, give me what they're teaching my 12-year-old daughter? And, you know, at the most they might get an outline that looks totally sterile as you, you know, as you're looking at, totally normal. Uh, but when you kind of look behind the curtain and you really understand what's being taught, um, you know, that's what we're finding to be definitely not age appropriate, definitely not medically accurate. And, um, and it's, uh, we've had a lot of success with it. So when you talk about having a parent forum, hmm. and maybe we should step back a little bit yeah. and talk about what is Mass Family Institute? Yeah, so Massachusetts Family Institute, uh, we've been the uh, local associate of Focus on the Family, which I imagine many viewers are familiar with Focus on the Family, a national organization. Um, we've been in Massachusetts for 28 years with a mission to strengthen and protect the family, the sanctity of life, religious liberty. Now, uh, helping parents understand what's going on in the school regarding sex ed. Uh, but basically helping uh, people understand what's going on in your state house, what's going on in your public school regarding the sanctity of life and religious liberty. So you are like a sister organization to Cornerstone Policy Absolutely. Research, yep. right? Yep. Uh, that is here in New Hampshire mm -hmm. and, and doing basically the same yeah. sorts of things, mm -hmm. right? Absolutely. So if anybody wanted to get in touch with Cornerstone, they can go to cornerstonenh.org mm -hmm. and, and find that information out, yeah. but if you happen to have friends and, and family in Massachusetts, then they go to the Mass Family yeah. Institute. Yeah, okay. I actually, one year ago, I used to live in Massachusetts. I now live in New Hampshire, uh, okay. which uh, we best move I've ever made uh, coming okay. to New Hampshire, <laughs> uh, but still work in uh, Massachusetts. My counterpart at Cornerstone lives in Massachusetts and works in New Hampshire. So. We kind of got them mixed up here, but uh, but it's all good. I think it's interesting that the two of you switch places, and I'm trying to figure out why Neil wanted to move to I Massachusetts. Know. Anyway. I know. I think he'll eventually make his way up north. So, but we'll so, tell us about the fan, uh, the parent forums. What yeah. are they structured in a certain way? Um, mm -hmm. What what? Uh, how do you get people involved in it? Yeah. How do people find out about them? Yeah, so they can go to our website, number one, to find out about it, which is mafamily.org, mafamily.org. Um, and it's one of the banners. If you, if you see the, the moving banners on the front, on the homepage, I think it's the fifth banner that you can click on. 
and that gives you a whole list of where we'll be, uh, you know, in the state. Um, but uh, yeah, the, the the parent forums. I think we wanted to do twenty of these in two thousand in, in two thousand twenty. Um, and I was telling you earlier, I think we'll probably complete twenty by the end of March. Um, just so, so we'll probably end up doing forty to sixty uh, in two thousand twenty, just because so many parents have been coming to us and saying, "All right, I need to know what's going on," because um, you know more and more parents are researching and um, you know knowing what's uh, going on. There's actually a, a great Facebook page called Massachusetts Informed Parents, uh, MIP, Massachusetts Informed Parents. Um, it's a great uh, Facebook page to go to and learn uh, what is going on in our schools. So um, a lot of stuff gets posted on there in terms of you know the curricula, um, a lot of parents sharing their concerns. And um, so if there's one place to go that's centralized information on this for Massachusetts parents. It's Massachusetts Informed Parents. You can find it right on Facebook. I think it was started maybe four months ago and it already has 3,000 members. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Good. Mm -hmm. And so what sorts of things are parents finding in their schools mm. that is offensive yeah. or something that they think is either not appropriate for public schools to be teaching yeah. or... Um, is not age appropriate. Yeah, well, we we are constantly told that what they're learning in school is age appropriate, that it's medically accurate. So if we kind of focus on those two, we say, okay, well, is it really age appropriate? You know, is it age appropriate to you know what one of the um, lessons that's considered age appropriate under the Massachusetts frameworks is a lesson called redefining abstinence, and it's. 30 different terms for abstinence. So you and I would, would define abstinence pretty simply, right? Two words, to abstain. Right. Pretty simple. This lesson that, again, is age appropriate, says, you know, I don't even know if I could say it on public television, to be honest with you, so I'm, I'm, I, I don't know, but it, it's being taught in your local middle school um, to 12-year-old girls and boys you know, that um, these 30 different terms that, you know, basically, if it's not getting the girl pregnant, if it's safe, then it's abstinence, right? So you can imagine, you know, what, what wow. is going on and what's being told to our kids. And of course, it's over-sexualizing our kids. So, you know, they're already on social media and there's so much access to pornography and explicit information online. And then you match that with, you know, all of your peers in the same classroom being taught by your authority, which is your teacher, and that this is completely normal behavior, then that just opens Pandora's box to, you know, so many different things. And, you know, the, the, the ironic thing is that Planned Parenthood is the major author of so much of this curricula. So you ask yourself the question, why is Planned Parenthood teaching safe sex, does that make any sense to their bottom line? When we know that a third of their budget comes from abortion. So they need unwanted pregnancy, right? To make right. that happen. Right. So it would make sense that they would go into the school and want to sexualize children so that they will get you know, women pregnant, so they will have the unwanted pregnancy uh, that leads to many of the abortions. And that's really the lie that we want to Exposed. It's interesting that planned parenthood yeah. would be in the schools in, at all anyway, because yeah. uh, you would think that that would be for the 20, 30 year olds who are getting married and having children, right. that you would really be focusing on that particular segment right. of society yeah. rather than going into the schools. So, yes, mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I just read a book by. Uh, Jennifer Roback Morris, hmm. who uh, is with the Ruth Institute, and she has one called um, The Sexualized State. Hmm. And in that, she talks about divorcing uh, sex from making babies. Hmm. And in and because of that, and you know, introducing the fact that you could plan your parenthood, that you could plan your pregnancies, etc. Hmm. 
that uh, those methods mm. are not fail proof. Yeah. They're not 100%. So then as a result, you have what you're talking about with abortion yeah. where you have, that has to be the one that makes it all okay. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I was talking to, I used to be a youth pastor before uh -huh. I was doing this job. And, um, you know, I talked to one of my students and I, I he's 19 at the time. And we were talking about when he was in, you know, I think it was Tingsboro, Massachusetts uh, high school as a ninth grader. And I said, you know, if you were to, if not that I want you to do this, but if, if you got your ninth grade girlfriend pregnant, um, you know, what did the teacher tell you? Like, did, and he said, well, I actually had that conversation. Um, you know, he didn't get his girlfriend pregnant, but he just said, if that happened, my teacher told, told us that there was a clinic, an abortion clinic across the state line in New Hampshire, where they could go to have an abortion done. And that there was never any talk of adoption, foster care, um, you know, any of this stuff. It was Informing all, their parents? Right, yeah, I mean, that's a whole nother, subject on parental rights, but the fact that his teacher is p almost pushing abortion, normalizing this and saying, look, I'm not going to tell you about adoption or foster care, but you can go right over the New Hampshire border and get an abortion if you want. Wow. You know, it's just unbelievable stuff um, that we're hearing from kids that, you know, unfortunately many times not telling their parents um, right. about. So. Well, I was shocked because I was in a, uh, a city council meeting and we were hearing about the process of uh, how they were handling vaping and yeah. informing the students about the, the new policy on vaping. Mm. And the presenter said, I have to be careful which counselor, what the counselor's credentials are, because there is a U.S. code that allows the students the counselor not to inform the parents oh, if the yeah. child is over 12 years of age. Yeah, well, this is very popular in Massachusetts. Um, so many of these towns and cities, um, you know, I'm not as familiar on the vaping issue, but on the uh, transgender issue, right, mm -hmm. or orientation, gender identity, um, that there are now these school policies that are being adopted statewide uh, that are empowering teachers to subjectively make decisions at school. So if your child, let's say, um, transitions gender at school, and, and you as a teacher think that the parent would disagree with that decision of their own child. Um, you know, maybe you see some kind of emblem on their car that's like, oh, that must be someone that's, you know, conservative minded or, or, or what have you, right? You, you're, you're allowed to make that subjective decision as a staff and not tell the parent about the transition going on at school. So you could be referring to this student as, a different name, as a different pronoun, um, you know, sh the student could be acting in a very different way at school, but all that's being hidden from the parent purposely because the, the new term now is called highly rejecting parent. That's the new term. So if you disagree with your child, you know, making a gender uh, transition. If you disagree with your child getting puberty blockers, which can cause sterilization in many of our young girls, right. if you disagree with a sex change operation that your child wants to have, you are now considered a highly rejecting parent. Um, and we even have a story in Massachusetts where thankfully we got involved, uh, but, but at the point we had gotten involved, DCF, Department of Children and Families, had already gotten involved with this young girl, taking her out of the home right, against the parents' wishes, um, actually called the family parish and said to the, ask the priest, how do you define transgenderism? I mean, going to that extent to, wow. to, to ask the priest, um, you know, the, the, there is this ideology, you know, the, 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 the people are so, you know, in DCF, I'm not saying all of DCF, but I'm just saying the people that were involved in this case, they're so ideologically bent on this idea that kids know everything, parents are the problem, right? I mean, this is what we see over and over so many times. You know, even when our parents go to the schools and say, what are you teaching my child? Or what book do you have in the library that I'm concerned about? Or, or any of this, parents are seen as the roadblock. And I believe, I truly believe this is what so many of our school officials, so many of our teachers are being taught in these training sessions is watch out for the parents because they're the problem. And, if, and, and the, the child we have to protect from the parent. Right. I mean, it's absolutely well, crazy. Well, and, and it, it's crazy because one of the major pr 
um, complaints you hear from mm. teachers when uh, we're talking about children learning yeah. is that there's no parent involvement. And mm. yet, here on the other hand, and why I was totally taken aback by this rule, and I did go look it up, and yeah. it is actually in the code, that uh, if the child is 12 years of age and they do not want the parent to know, mm. you cannot tell the parent. Right. And this is just insanity. In fact, I, I can remember back and a, a while back, my husband and I both said, it's like when you show up on the doorstep of the school, mm. that there is this red blinking light that goes off and says, parent in the building. Yeah. Because you are suddenly, everything is supposed to be yep. uh, non not for you to know. Mm -hmm. Not you. You're not supposed to know test results. You're not supposed to know uh, what relationships are mm -hmm. going on. And uh, clearly, harming a child. Yeah. And uh, by removing healthy body yeah. body parts, exposing and whatever happened to the the whole deal where we didn't want um, performance enhancing drugs to be used, mm -hmm. and yet now we're saying that you can uh, expose these children yeah. to hormones mm -hmm. that are lifelong Yeah. Forever. Well, imagine what it must be like to be a tomboy today, right? Yeah, Growing you up as can't a, as a, be. You can't be. You know, yeah. you, you, you have these, I mean, there's this one homework assignment from the Trevor Project. Uh, people can look it up, trevorproject.com. And um, at the top it says, I think it's for high school students, and it says, your gender basically basically can change from day to day, right? Within 24 hours, your gender can change. Um, it says, choose how you feel today because tomorrow it could change, right? And then there's five different spectrums. The first spectrum is biological sex, what the doctor assigned you at birth. So were you assigned your gender? <laughs> and this is why we talk about medically accurate. I mean, this yeah. is not medically accurate to, to, to be telling kids to normalize this kind of thing. Absolutely. And to say the doctor just decided that you were male or female, but even though you had a penis, you know, I don't know if I can say that on, on public radio or on public television, but you know, even if you had that, that doesn't necessarily mean you're male, right? I mean, this is the craziness that's gone on. And then you go down, you know, one spectrum is, um, you know, and again, it's masculine, feminine, um, how does the world see you, right? So um, I, I always tell the story, you know, when I was 12, my voice hadn't fully changed in terms, you know, I was still kind of speaking in the upper registers and right. I, was, I was singing in the choir in the soprano section and, you know, and there were, you know, all these girls around me and, and as a 12 year old, you know, growing up in Pennsylvania, I thought it was the best thing ever, right? right. Uh, but imagine yourself today, where it's being suggested to you that, oh my goodness, you're singing in the soprano section and there's no other boys there and your voice hasn't changed, you know, or you're walking a certain way or you, you know, whatever it is, maybe you're not fully masculine. And so when you answer that question of how the world, how does the world see you? And you have, if you go on Facebook today, you have over 55 different, um, 55 different choices to choose from in terms right. of gender. I think it's even more now. Right, so now you're on this spectrum of 55 different choices and you're like, well, I'm not fully masculine, but I'm not fully feminine. So maybe I'm kind of like over here on the spectrum, but now you're on the spectrum and you never would have questioned before, but now you have this homework assignment, your teacher's normalizing it, and now you start to question. And that's why kids today are 10 times more likely to question their gender than adults. So does that mean we have to have 55 different varieties of restrooms so that we can yeah that's uh, the craziness <laughs> i mean the I fact mean, that we're even asking that question and have to think of an answer right, right for that exactly. and, and and the problem with that is that the kids that you know might you know have a different opinion are the ones that have to use the different bathroom right, right. i mean we're talking about you know less than a percent of the population that identifies on this transgender spectrum. So 99% of the school is gonna change all of its behaviors right. when using the bathroom, for right. example. And if you don't, then you can be suspended from school because you don't cooperate. Right. As I mean, if you're, tr you're trying to talk normal, right. common sense, then you can be exposed. I wanna shift just a little bit. You are also doing uh, what they call lobby days. Yeah. In, and what are lobby days? So our annual Pro Family Lobby Day um, has 
grown tremendously over the past three years since we've really started to do more church outreach, um, do these parent forums, you know, get people aware of what's going on. So um, three years ago, we had about 50 people. Then we had about 125. Last year, we had over 500. And this year, we expect 1,000 people to come down to the State House in Boston and petition their legislator regarding really three main bills that we're concerned about. The infanticide bill, which is also called the Roe Access Act. So it's that very similar bill to what they passed in New York uh, you know, when they lit up the Empire State Building pink because they wanted to celebrate the fact that now we can legally kill born babies. Uh, you know, so after babies abortion. that survive a, an abortion right. attempt. Yeah, yeah. And then taking away all parental consent. So, you know, if you're a 12 year old at school and you want to get a Tylenol, you need to get parental consent. But if you want to have an abortion after nine months and that baby's born alive, no parental consent. Right. It's absolutely nonsense. Um, so the infanticide bill. And, and thankfully, that's, that's actually getting around the Massachusetts law that says that parents have to be informed, right? Absolutely. Or give, it, it, and it, give it, a it, consent. It not only strikes consent, it strikes the safeguards. That's why we call it infanticide because there's a section called, I think it's 12P, that's in the current law that um, gives accountability for that baby to keep, to resuscitate, to keep that baby alive. But okay. what this new bill does is it takes those safeguards out of the law. So now you've 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 you know doctors can do whatever they want or parents can do whatever they want. And if you remember the the uh, video of the Virginia governor, Governor Northam, uh, that really went around on YouTube a lot and, and they asked him, "Well, what are you going to do with the baby if it's born alive?" "Oh, we'll just make it comfortable while mom and doctor make a decision or, you know, about what they want to do." It's horrendous, horrific. Yeah. Um, so thankfully, it's still in committee. Um, even in Massachusetts, that you know, many would have expected Massachusetts to be the first one to pass this kind of bill. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, there's a lot of concern about it, and we strongly believe because we had a thousand people last summer show up for the hearing. We actually outnumbered Planned Parenthood, if you can believe it, uh, in Boston, Massachusetts, at the State House Excellent. for the hearing. Mm -hmm. um, so that's one bill, and then the physician-assisted suicide bill uh, that we're concerned about. Uh, we'll be petitioning on that, and then the sex ed mandate, as we're talking about sex ed, there's a sex ed mandate that basically would mandate the frameworks, the age-appropriate and medically accurate frameworks, so that if you are a school that chooses to teach sex ed. You know, you don't have to teach sex ed in Massachusetts, but if you choose to, you have to come under these frameworks. And so the state is gonna pass this list, and that's why it's a mandate. So now, if you're a local school board, or whoever's choosing the curriculum, you're, you have to choose from this mandated list. So you no longer, you know, we just fought this fight in, in Worcester, where Worcester had something called the Michigan model. And, uh, you know, most likely that would not be on the framework's age-appropriate, you know, list, right? Um, we were able, again, to outnumber Planned Parenthood in Worcester, and we defeated Planned Parenthood in the second largest city in Massachusetts. I, I think it was the second largest city in all of New England um, when Planned Parenthood wanted to come in and teach comprehensive sex education. So we want to defeat this on the local level, but the sex ed mandate we want to defeat on a state level. Right. So on lobby day, uh, we'll be petitioning our, our legislators, all 200 of them, on that. And then, um, what was the other one? And then we, we will be talking about recreational marijuana. We want to um, add churches to the buffer zone. There's a 500-foot buffer zone uh -huh. that um, if, you're, if a pot shop is within 500 feet of a K-12 through school, you can't put the pot shop there. We want to add churches to that buffer zone because there's over 8,000 churches. There's actually probably more than that in Massachusetts, if you can believe it, uh, because there's this huge immigrant church in Massachusetts that nobody knows about. Uh -huh. um, so we want to put churches in the buffer zone, which would limit the real estate that all these pot shops could could get um, right. in Massachusetts. Right. So those wow. are the four yeah. sex ed mandate, infanticide, physician assisted suicide, and the marijuana bill. Wow. And so uh, on lobby day, mm -hmm. when people come, are they prepared? I mean, do they know who their state legislator is that they're going to go and uh, express their opinion about? Yeah. Yeah. So many, many don't. I mean, most of the population doesn't know who their state legislator is, but um, 
if people just text the word lobby to the number 797979, which is our short code, um, so it's just three seventy nines, um, and text the word lobby. They'll get a return text with um, a uh, a link that they can register for the event, and then also um, it will send them a follow up email with their legislators' information. Um, so yes. we've tried to make it as convenient as possible. You know, you get your contact information, what room they're in. You know, so on the day of, which is uh, Wednesday. March 18th, so three weeks from now, uh, Wednesday, March 18th, from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m., so in the middle of the day, uh, we really encourage people to take the day off. It's worthwhile. Bring your family. You know, it's going to be about 1,000 people. It's going to be a wonderful civic engagement. Uh Um, You know, we're told, uh, Paul tells us in Timothy to, you know, petition those in authority so that we can all live peaceful and quiet lives. And so we can't just expect to live peaceful and quiet lives without doing anything, you know what I'm saying? And so we're asking them to uh, text the word lobby to 797979 to get involved. That's excellent. And so, you know, this is again, one of those situations where we're saying, if you see something, uh, eternal vigilance is the price of freedom, or Mm. the price of freedom is eternal vigilance, Mm. um, that we have to get involved. We yeah. have to, we can't just say it's let George do it. Yeah. George is you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and you. And uh, we, if we don't take the courage to stand up and be counted, mm-hmm. then the enemy, basically, yeah. uh, those who disagree with us will continue to uh, overrun us. Yeah. It's, it's the bully on the playground. Yeah, and I always tell people, be encouraged. You know, we defeated Planned Parenthood in Worcester. We outnumbered them in Boston last summer. Uh, you know, it's a great story in Lawrence. Lawrence was the first city to ban commercial marijuana in Massachusetts, and 200 people from the Hispanic churches there came out to defeat marijuana. Um, and there's story after story about how the local church in Massachusetts is making a difference. Well, thank you so much, Michael King from the Mass Family Institute mm. for co- coming in and joining me on the Chick Chat and uh, on uh, the public television. Era. You're welcome. It was my pleasure. <laughs> yes. And thank you for all the work you're doing. This is awesome. Yeah, it's exciting. Yeah. So there's a good story to be told, even in Massachusetts. Excellent. Excellent. The preceding program was provided by an independent producer solely responsible for its content. The opinions expressed do not necessarily represent the views of this station, its staff, board of directors, or underwriters.